Chapter One of But Thy Love and Thy Grace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Trace. But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S.J. Chapter One. What should you take a chance on? Why, the diamond ring, of course. It's only ten cents a chance, and there's nothing near as nice in the whole bazaar. The speaker was a young lady presiding over one of the prettiest and gayest booths in the St. Joseph's Orphan Asylum Bazaar. She was addressing her remarks to a girl who, as any woman could tell by her dress, was of the working class. The girl had a pleasing face. The features were refined, the eyes soft, and of the tenderest blue, looking out mildly and kindly from dark silken arched lashes upon a world which wondered why face and habit should correspond so ill. "'I might as well,' she answered. "'I have twenty cents left, and I'm going in a minute, and I don't care about leaving with any money.' Regina O'Connell had come into that bazaar with three dollars and twenty cents. It was not much to the bazaar, but to the gentle girl it represented the savings of six months. It represented all that she could spare for the orphans.' Regina wrote her name for two chances in the little book offered her, then paid her money. There now, she added with a little laugh, I am light of pocket, and, as far as the bazaar is concerned, I am through with it. The chance taken, Miss Margaret Dalton, who was prefect of the young lady's sodality, looked at Regina kindly. She was touched by the fragile beauty of the working girl. Wouldn't you like to look at the ring? she said. They all say it is a very pretty one. Thank you, answered Regina gratefully, but I know you're busy, and I don't want to take up your valuable time. Regina said valuable for valuable. Out of deference to the kindly young lady, she was using her best words and pronouncing them according to her lights. Oh, it will be a pleasure to me to show it to you, said Miss Dalton, taking the girl's hand as she spoke, and leading her toward that thing of beauty, the young lady's sodality booth. To make one's way through the crowd was no easy task. Wheels of fortune to right of them, wheels of fortune to left of them, a surging crowd all around and about them, many holding bats in their hands, many struggling to buy them, little boys who would get in the way, little girls who could not get out of it, a gentleman whispered to be running for office, surrounded by a knot of laughing girls, each waiting for her turn to hand him her chance book some five or six young men smilingly trying to escape from a zealous old lady, who was endeavoring to impress them with the idea that a silk dress which she was raffling would fill a void in their lives. All these things made progress onward a thing which required vigilance and determination. It was indeed a pretty sight, revealed by the hundreds of sputtering electric lights. They shone upon faces which were on a parade of joy. When people come to a bazaar, it is only the first step that costs— once they have determined on going, once that they have set aside the money, they intend spending, and strong a will and armed in triple brass, is he, who goes not beyond the limit he has set himself. The rest is a merry revel. If you wish to see for yourself that it is better to give than to receive, by all means go to a charity bazaar. Men and women pay high prices for things they do not want, and then chuckle over their extravagance. They are particularly happy when they pay something for nothing, and they become idiotically ecstatic when they have to borrow car fare to get home. An hour in a bazaar is a crowded hour of joyous life, an hour where every second registers joyous greetings and unexpected meetings, happy laughter, and delightful little jokes, which fizzle away like the foam in a newly opened bottle of champagne, and won't, in consequence, stand repetition. All this in a glory of flowers, in a wonder of colors, in a blaze of light, and a gleaming of eyes, and a shuffling of feet, and a hum of voices. Grief, for a season, bids the place farewell. She stands at the door without, stands so long that sometimes she falls asleep, and so lets her patrons depart unconcerned and merry. Through such a crowd and in such an hour did Regina and Miss Dalton not unsuccessfully struggle. Within five minutes they had made over fifteen feet, I couldn't do better than you, Miss Dalton, in ground gaining, the best day I ever played on the gridiron, said Fred Morris, the great half-back of the St. Francis College team, whom the young men of the city worshipped, and of whom the older citizens had never heard. Indeed, 
said Miss Dalton sweetly, but not at all appreciating the compliment. Had he made a speech in Syrochaldic, she would have understood him equally well. At this juncture, an unexpected diversion attracted the surging crowd to another part of the building, leaving the immediate neighborhood of the young lady's sodality booth comparatively deserted, and Regina and Miss Dalton free to continue their progress without let or hindrance. They were standing presently before the large showcase of the wondrous booth. High on a throne of state, in the very center of the case, out from its blue, fluffy, satin lined box, gleamed the diamond upon a dainty gold ring. Regina's face lighted up, her eyes grew very big, and opened very large. Oh, isn't it lovely? No woman could have said less, or more. Perhaps you would like to have it in your hand, continued the sympathetic Miss Dalton. Her heart had warmed to the poor girl. Oh, don't put yourself to any trouble on my account, miss, answered Regina, still keeping her sparkling eyes on the diamond. How I should like to win it. Miss Dalton quietly slipped behind the counter, opened the case, and taking the ring from its box, handed it to the girl. Regina looked at it long, intently, hungrily. The diamond glittered in the light. When she raised her eyes, there were three diamonds glittering, at least, so thought a genial old Irishman, who had just lightened his purse and his heart by taking a chance on a picture rich in reds and destitute of the least vestige of green. So a parking charity carry a patriot. Sure, miss, he said to Regina as she raised her eyes. Sure, miss, that diamond would be lost in your little hand, for the boys would be looking at your shining eyes all the time, and wouldn't be looking at the ring at all, at all. The old man was then captured by a woman with a book, and so missed the chance of commenting on the rich blush which purpled Regina's cheeks. This diamond must be worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars, she said. I wish it were, answered Miss Dalton, suppressing a smile. It is valued at sixty-five dollars. Is that all? If I had it, I'd not sell it for that. No, indeed. I should be delighted if you were to win it. Thank you, miss. You are very kind. I don't know you, but your face is very familiar. Poor Regina got that word very badly, to me, and I don't feel as if you was a stranger. And I know your face very well, too, answered Miss Dalton, of set purpose avoiding the word familiar. If I'm not mistaken, you go to Father McNichols to confession. Oh, that's where I've seen you. I couldn't place you at first. But now I remember I seen you at church last Saturday evening. You're one of his penitents, aren't you? Yes, I've gone to him for a year. He has done a lot of good to me. He makes me come every week. Miss Dalton gazed at Regina more sympathetically than ever, as the girl again fell to contemplating the glittering diamond ring. Miss Dalton belonged to one of the leading Catholic families of the city. She was refined, of such a refinement, indeed, that she could go out of her own walk of life into the slums without rubbing off or tarnishing the bloom thereof. Here is another case, she reflected, of the loveliness born of frequent confession and communion. This poor child belongs to the tenements. She has lived, perhaps, amid scenes of squalor and drunkenness. Everything about her should have made her coarse and vulgar. Doubtless, she left school at the age of thirteen, and doubtless for a time she promised to go wrong and became coarse. Then a confessor got a hold on her and persuaded her to frequent the sacraments. And now she is pure and modest and gentle, and just as refined as any girl can be, who has hardly more than a bowing acquaintance with words of three syllables. I think I'll cultivate her. She's worth a hundred educated girls who think only of themselves. My name is Margaret Dalton, she said aloud. Would you mind telling me yours? Oh, no, I'm Regina O'Connell. I'm glad to make your acquaintance, Regina. It's fair we should know each other, since we sit beside each other in the church so often. Do you like going to confession every week? I didn't at first, answered Regina, returning the ring to Margaret. It took Father Nichols a long time to get me to do it. You see, I used to go out so much on Saturday night. I'm ashamed to think of it now. Those balls are horrible. You didn't think so when you went to them, I dare say. No, but I had no sense. Not that I have much now, for that matter. How long have you been working? 
since I was eleven. My father wasn't doing nothing, and my sister got taken down with some spinal trouble, and so I went and said I was thirteen. Don't be shocked, miss, but I didn't mind a lie more or less then, and got a position in a shoe factory, and I've been working there ever since, seven years. Do you like it? I have to. We're left alone now, me and my sister, and she's bedridden, poor thing, and the doctor says she won't last long. Oh, she's lovely and so patient. She never complains and never asks for anything, and she's praying nearly all the time. She's worth working for, and you can stick a pin in that. Regina colored, unrealizing that her last statement was couched in terms not quite suited to the occasion and to her companion. Is your sister alone all day? Most of the time she is, miss, but she says she is never lonely. She says her beads, and then the office of the Immaculate Conception, and then she has a book called Visits to Jesus in the Tabernacle. Father Lassance's book? I think that's the one. A lady was in the house about a year ago, and happened to see her, and sent her the book. She reads out of it for an hour or two every morning. Then in the afternoon she reads story books part of the time, and I think she does a lot of praying. On Sundays, though, there are lots of the factory girls who come to see her, and they are just lovely to her. They bring her flowers and fruit and cake, and they talk so nice in her room. Some of them talk pretty coarse at work, and some of them use pretty bad language, but they are good at heart, every one of them. I'm sure they are, said Miss Dalton, much better than people who would sneer at them. They are so unselfish. Once when Rose, that's my sister's name, was very sick. They took turns in staying up with her, two of them every night, and they went to work next day as though they had done nothing out of the usual. It's wonderful how kind everyone is to us. Won't you please take her these flowers? said Miss Dalton, bringing up from beneath the table a bunch of violets. Oh, cried the girl, her eyes again outrivaling the diamond. How good you are! She just loves violets and hasn't seen any since last year. These are very early, and they do smell lovely. Thank you, Miss Dalton, and now I think I had better go. By the way, would you mind my calling to see your sister some day? Mind? I was tempted to ask you, but I didn't like to. Very well. Please write the address on this card. It's in a tenement on Main Street, third floor back, murmured Regina apologetically, as she wrote her address. Oh, by the way, miss, if you were to let me have one of those books with chances on the diamond ring, I think I could try to have it filled out among my lady friends. In saying lady friends, poor Regina thought she was particularly happy. Miss Dalton could forgive more than that. If you fill out this book, she said, you will be a benefactor of our booth, and we shall be very grateful to you. I think I can do it, said Regina. Some of the girls won't come to the bazaar, but it's not because they do not feel kindly toward the poor little orphans. Some are ashamed on account of their clothes, and others because they haven't enough to spend. But there are plenty of them who will only be too glad to take a few chances, no matter on what. I'm going to talk up the time and ring, and I'm sure it will get them interested. Miss Dalton had not quite succeeded in dismissing from her imagination this poor, bright-eyed, eager girl, when Father McNichols greeted her. Ah, uh, Miss Dalton, this is no time for contemplation. Action is the order of the hour. I am surprised to see the prefect of the sodality bowed in thought, when she should of all women be up and doing. I will act on your advice at once, Father. Here is my book of chances on the diamond ring. Perhaps you would like to put your name down. No, I should not. What should I do with a diamond ring? However, I will take a few chances. Father McNichols took the book and glanced at the numbers. Whose name shall I put down? He said, half to himself. Regina O'Connell's, answered Miss Dalton promptly. Regina O'Connell? Never heard of her in my life. But you have heard her many a time, Father. She's a little working girl and one of your penitents. Then she must be a very good girl indeed, commented the father affably. Yes? Why, of course. All working girls are good. Never met any other sort since I was ordained. Well, Regina certainly is very good. She supports a sick sister, and works hard, and gets no pleasure in life, and is perfectly resigned and cheerful. She's a frail little creature, too, 
it reminds me of a premature white and pink blossom in early April. Please don't say she gets no pleasure in life, Miss Dalton. If, as you say, she is a weakly communicant, I am confident that God's love and grace make up for the things that are wanting in her narrow life. It is wonderful how generous God often is in filling with his heavenly consolations those whom he does not fill with bread. It is the rich that he sends away hungry. I am afraid, sighed Miss Dalton, that some of us have already received our reward. There, continued Father McNichols, after a pause, during which he was busily writing, I put Miss Regina O'Connell's name down for ten chances. I am going to tell her what you have done next time I see her. You will do nothing of the sort, cried Father McNichols. Oh, if you object. Day, interrupted the priest. On second thought, I believe you are right. The girl is my penitent, you say. Perhaps, knowing of this, she will be better affected toward me, and be more willing to take advice. Who knows but I may be called on to say hard things to her. Yes, you may tell her. I certainly will. And, Father, the poor girl was so delighted with the diamond, so anxious to win it. I intend to put her down for five chances every day until the end of the bazaar, and I'm going to get my sisters and brothers interested, too. And then, when some man comes along who is spending his money simply out of charity, you might suggest Regina's name. Some men are grateful for little hints. Goodbye, and good luck to you and all your undertakings. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Two. Three days later, or to put it more definitely, on the following Saturday at nine o'clock of the evening, Father McNichols, seated in his confessional, was making heroic efforts to keep awake. The person on the other side of the screen had finished her little tale of sins, and was saying, for these and all the sins which I do not remember, I humbly ask pardon of God, and of you, my ghostly father, penance and absolution. Father McNichols suddenly noticed with a start and a jerk that he had fallen into a trance, of how lengthy a duration he knew not. For your penance, my child, he said, say three Hail Marys. By the way, do you work? Yes, father. When do you stop? At half past five. Well, how is it you come so late? I'm such a sleepy head at this hour, you know. Can't you come earlier? I always do, Father. But the day I was going about among the girls who work in the factory with me to get them to take a chance on the diamond ring. Sleep very suddenly took unto itself the wings of the morning. The diamond ring, he repeated. It was no longer nine of the night, but five of the afternoon. Yes, Father. And I'm so thankful to you for putting my name down for ten chances. Miss Dalton told me about it. I'll feel happy over that, even if I don't ring the valuable ring. The word valuable quickened the confessor's memory. He knew few of his penitents in the confessional, perhaps six. One little boy made the confidior more gloomy and mysterious by confessing to Blessed Michael, the dark angel. A little girl, on the other hand, lightened the gloom of the same prayer by changing the archangel into an archangel. There was also a young lady who, for reasons known only to her creator, always giggled in saying, That's all, Father. A working boy invariably accused himself of committing the sin of detraction whenever he tried to pray. An old woman had the habit of cursing the devil, and Father McNichols, Wondering whether Heaven's Chancery said it to or against her account, was often tempted to ask whether she did it before or after meals. All these, and a few others who had certain peculiarities of voice or pronunciation, Father McNichols knew. Regina's earmark was the mispronunciation of several words, prominent among which was the word valuable. In Father McNichols' mind, Regina was catalogued as his valuable penitent. Oh, now I remember you, said the confessor. You're the girl that I thought God was calling to a high degree of perfection. You said that to me many times, Father. Yes, and I meant it. Do you make your spiritual reading every day? Yes, Father, for at least ten minutes. And don't you find that it helps you to pray better? Yes, Father. 
Whenever I read a chapter of Thomas Akempis with attention, I can say my prayers ever so much more easy. And what about that little prayer of St. Ignatius I gave you a few weeks ago? Do you say it? Sometimes, Father, when I'm brave. I hope you will grow brave every day, my child, and I don't wonder at your fearing to say that prayer. I know very holy men who say it with timidity. It is an act of perfect love of God. Also, it is an act of perfect renunciation. The very first words, Take, O Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will, whatever I have and possess, are perfect generosity. Then the words, Thou hast given me these things, to thee, O Lord, do I return them, are true gratitude and true love. Receive them, dispose of them, according to the extent of thy will, a resignation to God's will in all things. And then, my child, the concluding words, if really meant by their utterer, are enough to stir the courts of heaven. Give me but thy love and thy grace, for these are sufficient for me. That is one of the most sublimest prayers of human composition to be found outside of the Gloria and the Preface, if, indeed, either of these may be considered of human origin. When you really can say, and mean that prayer, you are on the road to sanctity. Ah, oh, but father, there is the trouble. There are lots of other things I want, and I'm afraid to think of praying not to get them. For instance? Oh, father, I do so want that diamond ring. And I do not think that you should want it with overmuch eagerness. Try to get rid of that desire, my child. It is only a vain imagination. And then, father, you know him. Oh, him, echoed the confessor mentally adding, I have forgotten all about him. Well, what about him? He's been drinking again, father, and I feel so bad. He promised me two months ago that he wouldn't touch a drop for a year, and now I don't know what to do. I've given him my promise, and I do love him, but it sickens me to think that I'm going to marry a drunkard. But what am I to do? For several seconds, father McNichols hesitated before answering, if he can't keep sober for love, now that he's trying to get you, he most probably will not once you are bound to him forever. Shall I give him up then, father? I leave that to your own judgment and the workings of grace. Meantime, try to say that prayer once every day, and especially just after receiving Holy Communion. God bless you. Go in peace. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Three The room of Regina O'Connell and her sister was small and very sparingly furnished. Two common chairs, a plain wooden table, a heavy bed of the same material, and a small stove made up the furniture. Upon the wall was a coarse print representing the Savior showing his sacred heart. It was so placed that the invalid upon the bed could see it without turning. Despite the poverty of its appointments, the room was as clean as the traditional Dutch kitchen. Rose O'Connell was lying on her back, her fragile hands clasped together over the coverlet. Her face was pale and thin. Her eyes were large, lustrous, and shaded by exquisitely penciled brows. Occasionally a moan of pain escaped from her lips. Suddenly she dashed her hands across her eyes. The look of pain disappeared as in a flash and a smile, joyous, expectant, glorified her pathetic little face. She heard the step, so loved, so familiar, without. The door opened, and Regina hastened into the room. "'How is my dearest little sister this evening?' she cried, bending down and kissing the upturned face. "'Fine, Regina. I've had several visitors during the day, and they all talked and laughed so that I forgot my poor old back. "'And how is the pain today? Ah, you've been crying, dearest.' Now, tell the truth, haven't you? A little, Regina, but it wasn't the pain altogether. What else, dear? You were coughing so last night, Regina, and then you look so tired about the eyes, and then your step isn't like what it used to be. It's heavier, and you don't smile so easily, and last night and the night before you was moaning in your sleep. Oh, my own dear sister, if you were to get sick and suffer— I couldn't stand it. 
Why doesn't God lay it all on my back? Let him put it on me. I'm used to it. Oh, I'm murmuring now. God forgive me. Rose began to weep afresh. There were tears struggling in Regina's eyes, too, but she kept them back bravely. Now, Rose, she said, don't you go praying to get my troubles. I won't have it. You've had your share and more. And then, Rose, I'm not going to groan any more in my sleep. I did have a little trouble, but it's all over, thank God. You know, he got to drinking again? Yes, I know. And I didn't know what to do, but today he went and took the pledge, and he won't touch liquor any more. He met me on my way home from work, and he was so nice and affable. He says he's going to be a man from this out. Oh, he was so nice, and he wrote me just the most lovely poem with his own hand. He did? Yes, he told me he sat up all night composing it. I've got it with me, and I intend to keep it all my life. Would you like to hear it, my dear? Oh, yes, just to think that he could write poetry. Let's hear it, Regina. From her bosom, Regina blushingly took out a sheet of ordinary foolscap paper. It's just lovely, she commented, and the words are so fine. Here's the way it goes. Believe me, if all these endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly to-day, which are changed by to-morrow and fleet in my arms, like fairy gifts fading away, thou wilt still be adored as this moment thou art, let thy loveliness fade as it will, and around the dear ruin each wish of my heart would entwine itself verdantly still. It's simply grand, cried Rose ecstatically. But that's not all, dear. There's more just as good. Read that part over, do. Oh, it is so beautiful and sweet, and it's true. You could never grow ugly to me, dearest, and your charms couldn't. What's that word? Oh, yes, your charms couldn't fleet. No, never, never, never. Read it again, Regina. I'm going to get it by heart. So Regina read the first stanza a second and a third time, after which Rose recited it from memory, clapping her poor little hands for joy at her success. Oh, I just love poetry, she cried, and I didn't know it. Regina, I'm going to give up storybooks and read poetry. It is heavenly. I'm just crazy to hear the rest now, and I'm going to learn it by heart, too. Go on, dear, read the rest. I wonder what he means by entwine itself verdantly still. What is verdantly? I guess it means like an ivy, or maybe a honeysuckle. Oh, Regina, I never thought so much of him before. With Regina and Rose, Mr. Thomas Betterly, age 23, occupation a mechanic, was always him. Her cheeks flushing prettily, Regina continued, It is not while beauty and youth are thy own, and thy cheeks and profane by a tear, that the fervor and faith of a soul may be known, to which time will but make thee more dear. Oh, the heart that is truly loved never forgets, and as truly loves on to the close, as the sunflower turns to her god when he sets, the same look which she turned when he rose. My, isn't it like angels talking? cried the invalid, her cheeks blazing with fervor. And it's so true. You do get dearer to me every day, Regina. Time does make thee dearer. And then it's so sad because there will be a close. I, I, think, dear, that I'm getting worse. And, and... Here Regina gave a little sob and the close is coming. But you will be my sunflower to the last, and I'll turn to you. She stopped suddenly. Regina had thrown her arms around the child's neck, and in a long embrace, they sobbed together. It was an hour of exaltation, the cross and the crown, the sweet and the bitter, the loveliness and pathos of two sweet and simple lives were wondrously intermingled. But the bitterness, the cross, and the pathos were all sweetened and made light by the faith and the love and the grace of him whose picture looked down on them both from the bare wall. Now, dear, continued Rose after a long silence, let us say that prayer together. It is a poem, too, and I am so tired, I want to say it while I can. Regina slipped to her knees, still holding the dear head with her arms. Together they recited, Take, O Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will, whatever I have and possess. Thou hast given me these things, O Lord. To Thee, O Lord, do I return them. Receive them, dispose of them according to the extent of Thy will. 
Give me but thy love and thy grace, for these are sufficient for me. Tomorrow, Rose added presently, I'm going to read nothing but poetry. It, it makes me love God more, and, and, you too, dearest. Kiss me good night. I am so tired, so tired. Regina kissed the wan face tenderly and then turned away. A shiver ran through her frame, and there was a coldness at her heart. How wan, how pinched, yet how unutterably lovely was the poor little fading rose. Oh, my God, my God, she muttered. Anything but that. Anything. She corrected her thought and added, Give me but thy love and thy grace. She was startled presently by the sound of Rosa's voice, clear but so weak. Regina, the pain is all gone. Oh, I feel so nice. There is a change. No pain. Oh, thank God for his goodness. It is gone at last. And now I shall sleep well. It is all gone. It has been with me since the new year. Thank God. I shall read poetry tomorrow. Nothing but poetry. And then... Good night. Regina said nothing. Her sister had sunk into slumber. How peaceful, how sweet, how lovely the face on the pillow had grown. Yes, the look of pain was gone. Thank God, thank God, echoed Regina. Thank God for all his mercies. A moment later there came a low knock at the door. Regina advanced on tiptoe. She found Miss Dalton standing without. Oh, how do you do, Miss Dalton? she whispered. You are most welcome. I didn't think you'd come so soon. My sister has fallen asleep. Do come and look at her. Just before she dozed off, she told me that all the pain had left her. And, oh, her face is so beautiful. She is sleeping so soundly and doesn't moan as she used to. Thank God, thank God. Come and see her, and step lightly, miss, for Rose has not slept sound these many months. Tomorrow, she added absently, she is going to read poetry. Miss Dalton followed Regina to the bedside. As she looked, she started. Then bending down, she put her face close to the sleepers. Does the priest come to see her occasionally? She asked presently. Oh, yes, Father Dillon, our parish priest, has been just lovely. He anointed her one week ago, and this morning he brought her Holy Communion. But, Miss Dalton, why do you look so? What is the matter? My dear girl, said Miss Dalton, vainly striving to keep back the tears, your poor sister will never suffer again. Is, is, oh, Miss Dalton. God pity you, Regina. Let us kneel down and pray. The poetry of all the ages and of eternity itself had been thrown open to Rose O'Connell. End of chapter 3「But Thy Love and Thy Grace」by Francis J. Finn, S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 4 The bazaar had come to an end, but all was not finished. Among other things, the raffle of the diamond ring was postponed. Some of the books containing chances had not been returned in time. And, moreover, there was a demand on the part of a great many for more chances. So for three weeks after the closing of the bazaar, the books went round merrily. After the burial of Rose, poor Regina was utterly disconsolate. Many and many a time did her heart grow rebellious against the will of God. She found it almost impossible to pray. She muttered the words with her lips, but her heart was turned to Rose, and crying out for her to come back. Oftentimes despondency so seized her soul that she was frightened at herself. Then, in bitterness of heart, she would repeat over and over, Give me but thy love and thy grace, but thy love and thy grace. Poor child, she was alone in the world. The girls with whom she worked were very gentle and attentive. He, too, rose somewhat to the occasion, and her love went out to him with its former freshness. She could not forget that his poem had brightened the last moments of gentle rose. The verses had put him in a new and wondrous light. Surely, the man who could write such sentiment and meter must be noble of mind and of heart. Tom was a great service to her in those first days of sorrow. Not the real Tom, but the Tom whom she saw under the light that was not his. Sometimes, and in God's sweet providence, 
it is good to live in a fool's paradise. As a matter of fact, Tom was below Regina in every way. He was coarse, selfish, and weak. His love for Regina was the most elevating thing in his poor, sordid life. Whenever he left her presence, he departed vowing to do better. The spirit, indeed, was willing. One week before the holding of the raffle, Miss Margaret Dalton called to see Regina. Well, Regina, she continued, after the first words of greeting, what are you going to do with yourself? I go to my work, Miss Dalton, but that doesn't take me from my thoughts. And then at night, when I'm alone, I sit here and think and remember. I'm afraid, my dear, that you are unhappy. Yes, Miss. Call me Margaret, please. Thank you. Yes, Margaret, I do feel so wretched. All the pleasure has gone out of my life. She paused, then added, Almost, for she was thinking of her ingratitude to her glorified Tom. But you must try to go on cheerfully, Regina. It is not the will of God, I think, that we should give ourselves up to the melancholy luxury of grief. We are on earth to serve him and to work. If you were to throw yourself into some interest or other and give your time to it, I am sure that your sister Rose would be pleased, and you would not feel the pain of her loss so sensibly. Yes, Miss Dalton, yes, Margaret, but I can't do anything. At night I feel worn out, and, worst of all, I can't sleep. And then, while I lay awake, I see her face coming and going, coming and going, shining out from the blackness of the room. And, oh, I wish... I wish over and over that I was dead and with Rose again. It's all a matter of a few years, my dear, said Margaret, softly, as she clasped the wretched girl's hands in her own. Be patient and wait. God is counting every moment, and each seed of sorrow, so in each moment, will blossom elsewhere into a flower of joy. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am, yes, Margaret, but then my heart gets so rebellious at times, and I feel impatient with God. It scares me. Oh, he'll not reward me for the way I've been acting. I think he will, my dear, for one moment of impatience in the hour. There are a thousand moments of resignation to God's will, and God will forget those moments of impatience, oh, so easily, but he will never forget all the other moments of resignation. Do you think so, miss? I certainly do. God's ways are not our ways. In my own case, I find that sometimes I forget a thousand and one acts of kindness and courtesy, shown me by a friend on account of one rude word or some slight oversight. It makes me ashamed to think of it when I remember how easily God forgives and forgets. Thank you so much for what you've said, Miss Dalton. It's just lovely, and I think I will be braver after this. Oh, Miss Dalton, tell me what to do. The words in which this question was couched recalled to the mind of the prefect a touching hymn to Our Lady of Good Counsel, sung, on occasions, by the Sodality Choir. Suppose, Regina, you join our Sodality. Our Blessed Mother, who is the consoler of the afflicted, will surely assist you in a special way, if you put yourself under her standard in a special way. Oh, I should so like to, but I was afraid to ask. Do you think I'm good enough? Indeed I do. But then... I'm poor, and there are so many fine ladies in your sodality. Do you think they would care about me being with them? I don't know what you mean by fine ladies, answered Miss Dalton with some vivacity. If you mean women whose standard of ladyship is the world's point of view, there are none with us. But I have yet to find out that worldly culture and wealth can give us as perfect a lady as do the frequentation of the sacraments and the living of a good Catholic life. There are domestics in the sodality, who have much better manners than their mistresses. In fact, the most vulgar people in the world, I believe, are the rich people who have not got quite used to their riches. Sometimes I have thought so myself. I've often wondered that the women who school the conductors and make fusses on the streetcars are always finely dressed. I haven't, Regina. Money has brought in and developed the vulgarity, and they are sufficiently educated to give it expression in the Queen's English. But to get back to the sodality. Oh, yes. I'll be delighted to join. I won it too long ago, but we were so poor, and poor Rose needed all we could earn. But now I think I can. Oh, don't bother about the money, Regina. We prefer good sodalitists to good money. 
though, of course, we need that, too. Father McNichols doesn't want any deserving girl to stay without because she is poor. By the way, how are you getting on with the book on the ring? We want all the returns in by Monday. The raffle takes place on the following night. That's a fact. How careless and selfish I've been. I filled my book long ago, but my poor sister's death drove it out of my mind. Here, she added, pulling out the drawer of the table and bringing therefrom a package neatly done up in white paper. Here's the book and the money. By the way, couldn't you give me another book? I want to work now. From now till Monday, I'll give all my spare time to getting chances. Oh, she broke out, her eyes kindling. It is such a lovely ring. I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I still want to win it. You shall have another book tomorrow, Regina, and don't forget to come to the next meeting of the Sodality. You shall be most welcome. Keep busy, Regina. Your sister is happy and wants you to be content. I had Father McNichol say a mass for her yesterday. Regina had no words to thank Miss Dalton for this great kindness. The tears came to her eyes as she pressed the hands of her new friend. Miss Dalton left her weeping, but happier than she had been since the death of her sister. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Put Thy Love in Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S.J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 5 It was the night of the raffle. On that occasion, the library hall of the young lady's sodality was almost uncomfortably crowded. The workers in the bazaar, and their number was legion, were all present, and so were their friends and their friends friends to about the fourth degree. The librarian, smiling and affable, was showing, not without pride, the treasures of the library to several portly gentlemen, one of whom, as his features indicated, was of Jewish blood. A whisper went round among the workers that he was as rich as Caresus. That's the way it started, but, by the time it had passed from one mouth to fifty, it was crept into, he's as rich as crazy whereupon the uninitiated gazed on him fixedly, many wondering whether he was as harmless as he appeared to be. Did the librarian know he was crazy? they asked themselves. Apparently she did not, for her easy air of smiling unconcern, and her light laugh, rich in cheerfulness, evinced that she was utterly without fear. He doesn't look crazy, Regina was saying to the secretary of the sodality. Crazy? I should think not, returned the official. He's a very good, sensible man, and has been one of the best friends of our bazaar, even if he is a Jew. By the way, do you know that you and he have done more to bring in money on the diamond ring than any two people in the city? Him and me? cried Regina, the color rushing to her pale cheeks. Why, I didn't do anything to speak of. I just got three books filled. Yes, but all the same, your name is down for more chances than his, and he paid down cash for fifty in my presence besides other chances I've heard he's taken. At this moment, the prefect of the stality, accompanied by the two assistants, came over to where Regina was seated. Miss O'Connell, said the prefect, in the name of our sodality and the orphans, we wish to thank you for the work you have done in the interests of our raffle. If there were a dozen more like you in our sodality, I think we should practically own the town. Thank you, Miss Dalton, said Regina, rising in some confusion, her face, which had grown pale and wan since we last saw her, flushed violently. "'And I do hope,' added the first assistant kindly, "'that you may win it.' "'And so do I,' said the second assistant, her eyes beaming genially through her glasses. "'I'm sorry I can't agree with you,' said the librarian, as she pushed her way up to the group, along with the man who was rich as crazy. "'Here's my candidate for the ring. He wants it, and, if he wins it, he intends to present us with fifty dollars for our library. Oh, dear, cried Regina. If that's the case, I, I, almost hope he'll win. Let me suggest an amendment, said the prefect. Mr. Fairweather, I propose that, in case you win or Miss Regina O'Connell, you give the fifty dollars. You see, Mr. Fairweather, Regina has worked harder for that ring than any one and in the number of chances taken, she is your rival. Mr. Fairweather looked at Regina kindly and benevolently. He took in much of her story at a glance. 
Had she been the finest lady in the land, he could not have been more courteous. It is indeed a pleasure, he said, bowing, to meet a rival in such a cause. They are not the kind I usually meet, I am sorry to say. Miss Dalton, he went on, I'm obliged to you for the suggestion. I shall be delighted to give your library fifty dollars if I win, sixty dollars if Miss O'Connell be the lucky one. Oh, my goodness, cried the librarian. I do hope things will go as they ought to. Mr. Fairweather, you are so good and kind that I will add another suggestion. In case neither of you win, we may count upon twenty-five dollars anyhow. May we not? What do you say to that, Miss Dalton? said Mr. Fairweather, smiling benevolently. It's a brilliant suggestion. The librarian laughed lightly and glided away. She knew that the matter was settled. Somewhat to Regina's dismay, the old gentleman seated himself beside her. Is he crazy? she asked herself. But even if he were not, it would be an ordeal to make talk with a man whose daily income exceeded her entire earnings of a year. Presently, nevertheless, she found herself talking easily, frankly, about her sister and all the circumstances of her lovely death. Next, she was listening intently to Mr. Fairweather who, despite a slight German accent, spoke with a noble impressiveness. He was conversing about death, and saying how much he wondered at the quiet, calm way in which good Catholics await the final summons. Had he been a priest, his sentiments would have been perfectly appropriate. Just then a hale old gentleman clapped his hands for silence. He was standing on a raised platform. "'Ah, that's Mr. Dalton,' whispered Mr. Fairweather to Regina. "'What? The father of Miss Dalton?' Yes, and one of the finest men in town. If all your rich Catholics were like him, you wouldn't need bazaars. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dalton was saying, I have the honor to announce to you that we are now going to find out to whom the diamond ring belongs. We are going to go about it in this way. In this bag, here Mr. Dalton gravely held up a white sack, upon whose chaste surface there shone out in blue characters, XXX, finest brand. In this bag are all the numbers taken by the various chance takers. Out of this bag the lucky number will be taken. The first, second, and third numbers will not count. No, the thirteenth number taken out will be the lucky one. Now we want a little boy, the littler the better, to take out the numbers, and one man to read them out, and another man to verify his reading. Mr. Fairweather, couldn't you? Excuse me if you please, Mr. Dalton, interrupted Mr. Fairweather but I hope to win that ring myself. Get someone who isn't quite so interested. A small boy and two men were presently secured. Mr. Dalton shook the sack energetically, then opening its mouth slightly, bade the urchin thrust in his hand and bring forth one slip of paper. The boy obeyed and gave the slip to the announcer. 1728, he called. 1728, cried the verifier. Again the bag was shaken. 1911, 2384, 4823, 9089, 402, 3112, 21, 1118, 2124, 3560, 832. Now, ladies and gentlemen, cried Mr. Dalton in a loud voice, though he might have spoken in a whisper, and men heard, so tense was the silence, the next number is the winning number. May the one who gets it deserve it. Whereupon he began to shake the bag with comical violence. The laughing that followed suddenly changed to a groan as the mouth of the sack slipped in his hand and a number of tickets flew through the air and fell scattering upon the floor. The crowd moved back and the workers were upon their knees at once, recovering the precious slips. Say, whispered the librarian into the ear of the kneeling prefect, while you're down there, say a little prayer that Regina O'Connell may win. Isn't she a dear little thing? We've all been praying for her, answered the prefect. Quickly the slips were recovered, quickly were they returned into the sack, and violently, but with much more care, did Mr. Dalton shake it for the last time. The boy took out a slip and handed it to the announcers. Number 306. Ah, came involuntarily from the mouth of Miss Dalton. Number 306, announced Mr. Dalton, finding the corresponding stump in a book handed him. Miss Regina O'Connell. At this there was tremendous applause. It's one of the ten chances that Father McNichols took for her, 
whispered the prefect to the librarian. At the mention of her name, Regina arose and stood in some embarrassment, whereupon Mr. Fairweather, with knightly courtesy, escorted her to the foot of the platform, and, taking the ring from Mr. Dalton, handed it to the girl. "'Miss O'Connell,' he said, "'I've been beaten before, but this is one of the few times in my life that I am glad to be worsted.' Amid another burst of applause, he conducted Regina back to her place, where she was forced to shake hands with and receive the congratulations of nearly all in attendance. Regina was very happy then. Why? Who can tell? She had set her heart on the ring. It had fascinated her. Desire of it had grown with each day. And now it was her very own. And then, too, the kind words, the smiles, the sympathetic looks, of all these people, fell like balm upon her innocent heart. For a time the girl was in heaven. She slipped the ring upon her finger and turned it this way and that, watching its changing splendors with all the delight of a child. The poor girl was enjoying her first toy. She was aroused by the voice of Mr. Fairweather. Miss O'Connell, he was saying, in case you should ever wish to part with that ring. Oh, dear, no, interrupted Regina. Never. Mr. Fairweather smiled. Very good, Miss O'Connell, but in case you should, call on me at any time. I am willing, or rather, I should be glad, to pay you its market value, which is, I believe, sixty-five dollars. Here is my card with my residence address. Thank you, sir. You are very good, but I don't think that I should care to sell my beautiful ring for even a hundred dollars. I am very, very glad you like it so much, my dear young lady said the old gentleman, and indeed his kindly face gave earnest that his feelings were at one with his words. Regina was about to acknowledge his gracious speech, when Mr. Dalton again clapped his hands and called the assembly to order. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'I take great pleasure in announcing to you that, in honor of this pleasant occasion, an occasion for once when the right prize goes to the right person, Miss Rosamond Otis, the gifted soprano whom all Cincinnati delights to honor, has kindly consented to sing a solo. Mr. Dalton held up his hand for silence. Nevertheless, the applause continued for nearly a minute. Miss Otis, a tall, handsome young lady, stationed herself beside the piano and accompanied by the pianist of the occasion, sang, May Morning. The audience was so delighted that an encore was imperative. After a short delay, Miss Otis sang, Oh, believe me of all these endearing young charms. Oh, cried Regina involuntarily, and putting her hand to her heart. Then she addressed herself to listen. Regina had Irish blood in her veins, and no person of Irish blood ever yet listened unmoved to this sweet melody. But to Regina it appealed, as, perhaps, it never yet appealed to any listener. Again she was standing beside her dying sister. Again she saw the dear face flush and the gentle eyes kindle under the inspiration of the poet's thought. Despite her endeavors, she could not restrain a sob, and the tears rushed to her eyes and stained her wan cheeks. She hid her face in her handkerchief and listened with all her soul. Miss Otis was at her best on that memorable night. She sang with a pathos which went to every heart. Presently, the weeping girl began to wonder where Miss Otis could have got the verses. Regina wore them next her heart. She had shown them to no one save Rose. Here was a mystery to be cleared. With an effort, she composed herself. Sir, she said to Mr. Fairweather, aren't they beautiful words? Very, answered the old gentleman emphatically. I know who wrote them, sir. No doubt, no doubt, assented Mr. Fairweather affably. Everybody with Irish blood knows and loves Tom Moore's Irish melodies, and a great many with no Irish blood at all. Myself, for instance. More, repeated Regina, looking puzzled. Yes. Why, what's the matter, my dear young lady? Of course you know that Tom Moore wrote them, as you said. Regina gave a gasp of pain. All the color had left her face. She rose nervously. But what's the matter, Miss O'Connell? Are you ill? Can't I do anything for you? No, no. I... I must leave at once. Excuse me, sir. I wish to be alone. Regina slipped from the hall, and once she was on the staircase, landing outside, she gasped and grew faint, and was obliged to lean against the wall for support. 
No tears came to her eyes. Her grief was beyond that. The moment of disillusionment had come, and a terrible, almost heartbreaking moment it was. Her love was gone forever. She had loved, not Tom, but her own false, though noble conception of that very ordinary young man. But now the ideal had crumbled away, and she stood face to face in her mind's eye with the real, a coarse, selfish, untruthful, weak-willed lover. Grief changed to rage. For the first time in many a long year, Regina was really angry. The great wave of indignant feeling which flooded her soul submerged her reason. She was beside herself. The weakness and the dizziness were forgotten. She went down the steps quickly, her eyes flashing, her bosom heaving, her bloodless lips set together firmly. As she reached the sidewalk, a figure separated from a group of young men who were apparently loafers and came beside her. Mr. Tom Betterly had been awaiting her. She could say nothing just then, but she turned upon him a look of contempt that should have warned him. But it would have taken something far more powerful than any look to have warned Mr. Tom Betterly on that occasion. Regina, he said, speaking with that difficulty in pronouncing clearly, which we sometimes notice in those who have just come from the chair of a dentist. Regina, he continued, and there was a beastly light in his eye. I congratulate you. I heard you won diamond ring. Is that so? He saw it on her finger. Ah, that's right. Then opening his mouth, he roared, Ka, ka, ka. It was a fearsome sound. Mr. Thomas was rejoicing after the manner of his kind when in his loose tooth condition. He had never before been quite so tipsy in Regina's presence. As with a mighty force of brazen mouth and iron lungs, he croaked forth the third call. He attempted to put his arm around her waist. Then his arm, as it touched the girl, and she drew back, remained fixed as though paralyzed. The blazing eyes of Regina had caught and almost sobered him. Go, she hissed. Go. I never want to see you again. You, you wretch. He stood there while she went on, and he knew that, so far as she was concerned, it was all over with him forever. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Six The force of habit is something wonderful. Blinded with rage, carried away by her feelings so that she was no longer a reasonable being, Regina nevertheless turned when she came to the parish church and entered it. She had no intention whatever of stopping, no intention of entering. All the same, she did both. For years it had been her pious custom never to pass the church without paying a short visit to the prisoner of love, living his hidden life in the tabernacle out of love for ungrateful men. When Regina came to realize where she was, she found herself kneeling in a pew far up the nave before the statue of the meek and lowly Savior, exposing to her and to all who visited him his most sacred and adorable heart. Oh, why am I here? Why am I here? she moaned. I cannot pray. I cannot look at him now. God help me. Her feelings were in an angry whirl. She was indeed beside herself. She could not collect her thoughts. She could not even kneel, and sank back upon the bench, burying her face in her hands. Oh, if she could but drive the black hatred and the black bitterness out of her heart. If she could but turn her thoughts from that awful disillusionment. No, no, it is impossible. I shall not be able to pray again for a long, long time. Oh, God, I am a sinner. To think that I went to Holy Communion only yesterday. Oh, God, O oh Savior, have mercy upon me, a sinner. It belongs to God, our Lord alone, says St. Ignatius in his spiritual exercises, to grant consolation to the soul without any preceding cause for it, because it belongs to the Creator alone to go in and out of the soul, to excite motions in it, attracting it entirely to the love of his divine majesty. I say without cause, that is, without any previous perception or knowledge of any object from which such consolation might come to the soul, by means of its own act of the understanding or will. This principle had never been expounded to poor Regina, but then and there she learned its truth experimentally. She fell upon her knees. Peace, be still, 
said Christ to the storm. And forthwith there was a great calm. Tears sprang to the girl's eyes, great tears of love and of peace. In her soul she saw our Lord, and seeing him, her heart grew glad, and brave and strong, with the burning love himself had enkindled. After the storm had come the calm, after the darkness a great light, after sin and passion, pardon and peace, after hatred, love and forgiveness, after man, Christ himself. When Regina left the church half an hour later, her face was sweet and radiant. She had gone one step further in renunciation, and had, with a fervor to her altogether new and wonderful, said that sacred prayer. Take, O Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my whole will, whatever I have and possess. Thou hast given me these things, O Lord. To Thee, O Lord, do I return them. Receive them, dispose of them according to the extent of Thy will. Give me but Thy love and Thy grace, for these are sufficient for me. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter Seven When Regina reached her room, she lighted the candle and composed herself to make her spiritual reading. For some weeks past, she had been reading The Life of St. Jean Francis de Chantal by the Abbe Bougard. Only the night before she had come upon a pretty story of how Christ had almost literally forced a young girl to love him. She had been led onward by the path of renunciation. When Regina read it, the narrative had appealed to her as being pretty and touching. But now, looking back, it haunted her. She felt in her soul that she had not got out of it all the meaning, that there was, perhaps, in it some message for herself. She turned back a few pages and again, and with other eyes, read this account of the hard-won spouse of Christ. But of all whom the grace of God snatched from the world, in spite of themselves, none so obstinately resisted at first, or so generously submitted when vanquished, as Marie Marguerite Michel. She belonged to a wealthy family of Franche Comte, and, like many other young girls, her danger lay in her beauty. One night it seemed to her in sleep that a child clothed in white approached and scratched her face, saying, you will now be much more beautiful in the eyes of your spouse. Marie Marguerite awoke, screaming, and insisting that the skin had been torn from her face. Her mother, finding nothing the matter with her face, treated her as a silly dreamer, and bade her go to sleep again. Two days later, Marguerite was attacked by the smallpox, and her face did, indeed, become disfigured. But she still possessed so many means of pleasing the world, and she was still so witty, lively, graceful, so accomplished in every way that she thought not of abandoning her life of pleasure and dissipation. One day, while resting after a grand ball, there suddenly appeared before her the same child that had scratched her face. He seemed irritated. You are going too far, he said. I know how to put a stop to the mad extravagance of your youth. And taking hold of her feet, he crushed them so severely that she screamed aloud. Shortly after she fell and hurt her foot, so seriously that, despite all remedies, she was lame for the rest of her life. On the fourth day after this accident, as she was crying and grieving, the child again appeared, but this time radiant with light. Marguerite was frightened and hid her head under the bed covering. I told you, said the child, smiling, that I would succeed in putting a stop to the follies of your youth. Give your heart to God now, since your body is disfigured. Marguerite tried to obey. It was, in fact, upon the bed of pain, where she lay for six weeks, that she learned to pray, and that her soul began to relish heavenly things. Nature, however, was far from being conquered. One day, in the early part of her convalescence, she chanced to see herself in a mirror. Her disfigured face and crippled figure brought tears to her eyes. At the same instant the child again appeared, holding a veil upon which the figure of Jesus dying was depicted. Ah, oh, what is that? exclaimed Marguerite. It is the lover of your soul, answered the child. See to what love has reduced him. Marguerite's heart was touched by these words, and from that time she loved her deformity, 
and would not exchange it for all the advantages the world could offer. She went to St. Francis de Sales, resolved to become a religious, but a little embarrassed because her family, opposed to her design, would not give her a dowry. Ah, well, said the saint, if you have nothing, we want nothing. Offer these two things to God, and go tell Mother de Chantel that she may receive you for nothing. The holy foundress received her with joy, and the saintly bishop himself deigned to give her the habit. Her novitiate was noted for her sacrifices, and her life for the numerous and admirable foundations she conducted. St. Francis de Sales used to say, Ah, how well this cripple walks! The cripple, indeed, governed the convent of Belay, de Jean, Vossel, and Arone, founded those of Besancon, Dole, Gray, Salins, and Solaire, arranged the foundations of Freiburg, Plaisance, Milan, and Munich, Bavaria, and if this cripple had lived one year longer, she would have carried the visitation to Canada. The simple girl, as she read these words, failed to make any comparison between herself and the high-born lady, and still, when she laid the book down, there came to her of a sudden the thought that perhaps the diamond ring, which she still strangely loved, was not for her. It is all I have left, she murmured to herself, and she gazed upon the twinkling splendor, the only toy that had ever brightened her life. Yet why should I give it up? The door opened slightly, and a voice without was heard to say, May I come in, Regina? The girl started, then recovering herself, arose and answered, Why, certainly, Mrs. Stevens, just look at what I've won. Mrs. Stevens entered. Her pleasant smile brightened the poor room. Oh, isn't it beautiful, she exclaimed, catching Regina's finger. And so you won it, after all. Yes, I was very lucky, wasn't I? Yes, my dear, and I'm so glad you won it. I hope that it will bring a little more joy and pleasure into your life. I often envy you, Mrs. Stevens. You were always so cheerful and light-hearted, and when Rose died you did so much for me without knowing it by your pleasant ways. You was always like sunshine when you came into my room, and— Regina broke off in the middle of her sentence. Mrs. Stevens had suddenly sunk into a chair, and all the sunshine and brightness were gone. Why, why, what's the matter? For answer, Mrs. Stevens began to sob. Dear, dear, I didn't say anything to hurt your feelings, did I? But the sobbing woman wasn't able to make any reply. Regina waited in distress till the first violent emotion had subsided. Surely, Mrs. Stevens, I have said nothing to hurt you, have I? The woman wiped her eyes, and for a few seconds held her handkerchief over her face. When she looked up again, she wore her calm, smiling expression as before. Excuse me, she said. I'm a bit nervous tonight. Please don't mind what's just happened, Regina. I, I lost control of myself. Regina, meanwhile, had been closely scanning the other's features. For the first time, she perceived that Mrs. Stevens' smile was a mask. There were lines of care and suffering upon the cheeks and an expression almost of agony lurking in the eyes. "'Mrs. Stevens,' she said, putting her arm around the woman's neck, "'please tell me the truth. You have some great trouble.' Mrs. Stevens melted under the kindness. Again her features twitched convulsively. Again she broke into sobs. "'Don't cry, please,' said Regina gently. "'I'm half-starved,' said the woman abruptly. "'What?' and my sick son is going into typhoid, I believe, and the older boy is out of work, and the children have eaten the last bite we have. Dear, dear, cried Regina. I spent my last cent today. I'm afraid to call for a doctor. There's nothing coming. Oh, why didn't God take me when he took my husband? Regina, I shall go mad. No, no, don't speak that way, please. When the shops open again in a few weeks, my boy will be working, but it will be too late unless I go bagging. I've pawned everything that will sell. Please take this, said Regina. You can't refuse it, and get your little ones and yourself something to eat. Regina held out a dollar to the woman, who first drank from it, then clutched it, oh, so greedily. The truth of her story was evidence in the act. 
God bless you, but it's hard to take it. Goodbye, my dear. When Mrs. Stevens had gone, Regina put on her wraps and hastened down the stairs. She took off the diamond ring in her descent, sighing as she did so. It was hers no longer. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 8 Mr. Fairweather, seated at his desk in the library of his house, was not a little astonished when the maid informed him that a young lady wished to see him. One moment, he said, and finished the letter he was writing. Now please show her in he resumed. Suppressing his surprise, when Regina O'Connell entered, he arose and greeted her cordially. "'You are welcome,' he said with his engaging smile. "'You must excuse me, sir, for coming at such an hour of the night, but I thought I ought to come. Sir, I want to sell that diamond ring at once. I have need for the money.' Regina had no intention of telling him for what purpose the money was needed. But, yielding gradually to the kind manner of the old gentleman, she told the whole story. "'Miss O'Connell,' he said, "'I will buy the ring, and pay for it, too, on two conditions.' "'Yes, sir?' said Regina interrogatively. "'The first is that you keep three-fourths of the money for yourself.' Regina was about to object. "'Now listen. The second is that you allow me to help you in this work of real charity.' Oh, thank you, sir. I shall never forget your kindness. Mr. Fairweather pressed an electric button. Get the carriage at once, he said to the answering maid. I will see to the doctor, he went on, and that other boy shall have work within a week. If I have to create a job for him. And now, he added, taking out a pocketbook, I think I can pay you in cash. Ah, uh, yes, he went on, as he passed a number of bills through his fingers. Here we are, five twenties. That's all right, isn't it? It did not occur to Regina in her excitement that five twenties were equal to one hundred dollars. Yes, sir, I'm sure it is all right. Very good. Give one of those twenties to Mrs. Stevens, my dear young lady, and keep the rest for yourself against a rainy day. Thank you, sir. You are so good. I hope I have not disturbed you. Not at all, not at all. And now be seated for a moment and excuse me while I go to the telephone. I shall come back presently. He was gone for several minutes. When he returned, he said, My doctor will visit the sick boy at once. And now, my dear young lady, you look very pale and tired. Is there anything I could offer you? A cup of coffee or... or... No, thank you, sir. I am not used to taking anything at night. The carriage is ready, sir, announced the maid. Very good. Miss O'Connell, it is late for you to be out alone. You must go home in my carriage. Regina could say nothing. Goodbye, he said a moment later, as he helped her into the carriage. I am very glad to have met you indeed. Please to pray for an old sinner. It was Regina's first carriage ride. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maria Therese. Chapter 9 Regina started blithely up the pair of stairs that led to her rooms, but her pace became perceptibly slower as she neared the first landing. On reaching it, she paused to get her breath. As she stood there, all the events of the last few hours came back in a panorama. The crowd, the lights, the winning of the ring, the loss of her lover, the visit to the church, the spiritual reading, Miss Stevens' story, the interview with Mr. Fairweather, her first carriage ride. And now the ring was gone, her first and last toy. Dear, dear, she gasped, it seems years since I won that ring, years and years since I left the hall. I must have lived half my life tonight. And indeed she had. Then she toiled painfully, laboriously up to the next landing, where she paused again. 
Regina was utterly worn out. It was in very truth a long, long time since she won the diamond ring, and she needed rest sorely, sorely. She started up for the last landing, when having made but a few steps, she was seized with a violent fit of coughing. When she took her handkerchief from her lips, it was stained with blood. She looked at it in the dim light, and suddenly grew very faint and dizzy. She swayed and tottered. Hello, cried a voice at her ear, though to her it sounded far away. What's the matter, my girl? Let me help you. The man, apparently a doctor, who thus addressed her, was on his way downstairs, and reached the fainting girl in time to prevent her from falling. With little difficulty, she was very light, he helped her up to her room. Mrs. Stevens, who had heard them without, showed him the way. Here, here, said Regina faintly, reaching out her hand to Mrs. Stevens. It was a twenty-dollar bill. The doctor, meanwhile, had taken Regina's handkerchief and brought it over to the light. Arterial, he murmured to himself. He approached the bed upon which Mrs. Stevens had laid Regina and made a hurried but careful examination of the new patient. Is she very ill? asked Mrs. Stevens. I should say that in all probability she has been very ill for many months. And so this is the girl who won the diamond? How did you know that, sir? cried Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Fairweather telephoned me the whole thing. The ring is gone, Mrs. Stevens observed. The doctor glanced at Regina. Her eyes were closed. She seemed to be asleep. Yes, it is gone, he assented. But she will never need it, poor child. But Regina was not asleep. She heard every word, and she understood. Yes, she would never need it. Then her heart rose to her best beloved, to him who had brought her safely along the thorny path. Give me but thy love and thy grace, she whispered, for these are sufficient for me. But thy love and thy grace. But thy love and thy grace. And she received his love and his grace, and in the receiving her heart throbbed with a bliss seldom known upon earth for his love and his grace were indeed sufficient. End of chapter 9 End of But Thy Love and Thy Grace by Francis J. Finn, S. J.